everybody, welcome to number 27. I'm Jack and this is a Morgan Roadster. Now, does it get any more British than this? Morgan made a virtue out of not really doing much to update its cars properly. For some reason, managed to make that into something that was an advantage. So you're talking about a car which has remained largely untouched for 69 years. I don't think any other maker can claim that. Sure, the Transporter from VW, the Corvette, the Mustang, they all have a longer lifespan, but they are not the same cars. They are several different models with the same name. This, the biggest update that it had was in this very car, which I think was out in 2004, which had a different engine, but the basic design has remained unchanged. It's incredible to think that at one point, Morgan had a waiting list for these cars of seven years despite them being so ancient in terms of technology. It does look fabulous, but one of the flip sides of such an old design is that they do supposedly drive like a really, really old car. Let's take it out, see what this one is like. It has the newer Ford Cyclone engine, and also the owner, David, has upgraded the suspension, so that might have taken some of the rougher edges off. Switching this on for the first time is quite a strange experience because you, the car looks so ancient that you're expecting like a, an old vibrating kind of engine with a rough idle and instead it's really quite unremarkable when you switch it on. It doesn't sound like anything in particular and at these lower speeds it feels quite odd because it doesn't sound very characterful so quite an odd way to begin. The interior is really, really lovely. I, I mean, they've done a really good job, I think, on the whole of having a very old style interior with some modern touches, modern instruments, some modern buttons there. Some of them are lovely, like these ventilation dials. I don't know if they come from anything, but they look and feel lovely to use. The only thing I would say is that those needles in the instruments, they just look really wrong. The ones on the clock, for example, which just have, they're simple, they're cheap, they're just sort of white, triangulated, would look a lot better there and would just have a little bit of a nod to the old fashioned stuff. Now it's odd, these cars have been going for so long, but they went through, they've always been in demand, but between the 70s and sort of mid 80s, 90s, most of the production was going to the US. In Europe, love with, they'd fallen a little bit out of love with it. And of course, it was using the Rover V8 at that point, and there was no way that was going to be passing emissions. So from 1974 to 1992, every single Morgan sold in the US with the V8 engine was sold with a propane conversion, with an LPG conversion, to make sure that they could legally be sold. Now, I don't know whether they could then also just put petrol in on the side, or whether they could only run on LPG, but incredible to think that they had to do that just to keep selling them. So when I told you they've been running since the 1950s, I really wasn't joking. They use sliding pillar front suspension. Now, if you Google that, this is the first image that you will see. I think it's a car dating back to 1902 or something ridiculous like that. So a really antiquated setup at the front. Likewise, at the back, it uses a Salisbury rear axle, an axle system that was really, really popular just after World War II. Again, that just says it all, really. Now, luckily, this car has had upgrades, both to the geometry of the front suspension and to the back so that the leaf springs at the back are gone and it now has normal dampers and springs and at the front i don't think anything radical has been done apart from changing the way the geometry is set up either way it really doesn't drive as badly on this country road as i was thinking and as i was i was dreading it really i thought on these roads they are super bumpy and it has a bit of polish you can feel the bigger bumps um but 
it's far more civilized than you would think. Now, I don't know if this is factory, but the indicator is incredibly annoying with that beeping noise. Now, this is a particularly bumpy bit of road, and on here, you really can see that even with this upgrade of suspension, it is being challenged. My chest and my head feel like they're in the right position relative to the wheel as well. The pedals are a bit close to my feet though, and something else which is quite difficult to get used to is the clutch. It's got a stiff clutch, not only that, but the springing action gets heavier just as you hit the, high, the biting point, which is quite high up. So I'm finding it really, really difficult to be smooth when changing gear. Just as you're trying to let the clutch out, it sort of pushes your foot back. This engine is the 3.7 Cyclone V6, which, fun fact, is also used in the Ford Transit, in a van. It's also used in the Ford F-150 and a whole host of other cars. There's a real disconnect for me between the car and the engine. When you're driving it around at these sorts of speeds, so at the moment, sort of doing between 40 and 50, it feels, you can see the rest of the car and it sort of feels quite antiquated. The steering is also quite slow, but the engine is so refined, so well-mannered, so easy to get on with, so it doesn't feel quite right. Let's try opening it up and see if that changes. Right, time for a little pull, Let's see how it performs. Just wait till we get past this cyclist, don't want to scare her senseless. Let's go. <laughs> 7,000 red line. As it, it really pulls, it's the torquey engine. It, once you start driving it hard, it makes, well, hardish, it starts to make sense. You've got the soundtrack to back up what you expect from the car. Still struggling a little bit with that clutch and the steering is so long geared. Even at these slower speeds, you can tell it needs an awful lot of lock. The, the steering feels very slow. This car has a very rare option. It has electric power assisted steering, which makes it a bit more manageable. I believe on the cars without that, the steering gets really heavy. And coupled with it being so slow, if you get it out of shape, it's very hard to collect them back again. What a strange, strange car. It's a quick thing, it really is. I don't think the chassis could handle it, even in this state where it is so much better. It feels like the damping is just as spot on as you could get it for a car like this. Also, in the corners, although I haven't been brave enough to push it properly hard, to me it's signaling that if you went in too hard, the front end would scrub away a bit of speed. I think that after that, they can unpredictably switch to oversteer. So it's not something that encourages you particularly to drive it hard, but I'm starting to feel quite at home in it. And the whole experience, the view over that bonnet, wow, I thought the E-Type was good, but this is just, it has to be one of the best views ever. It's incredibly flexible. It will pick up from anything like below sort of even 2,000 revs, six gear, 1,500 revs. It will pootle about just fine. Get it past two and it gets some sort of bit more meaningful acceleration. The steering is also quite vague when you start going quicker off center. And yeah, it just, it, it, it doesn't encourage this kind of driving. I, I'm not going too quick. Um, just challenging it a little bit. The brakes feel really good. Uh, not brimming with feel, but they, they're powerful enough. They give you confidence. It's a bit of a conundrum, this, because to me, it's way, way more fun when you're driving it a bit harder, when you're pootling about, because the engine is so restrained. 
it loses some of the charm I think it would have. And then you, you sort of prod that pedal and it really jumps forward. The noise starts having an impact and it all makes a lot more sense, except that the limits of the chassis are reasonably close. They're not, you know, it, it's not a real performance car. I think this is really as good as you are going to get for this design of Morgan. I mean, you had the V8s before this. That's quite a characterful engine. This is going to be much more usable, practically as fast. I think they're a bit less torquey, but I like that you have to rev it a little bit. I think perhaps just maybe open up that exhaust so that even when you're pootling about, it's making a bit more noise and it would be fantastic. Yes, you do have to be aware of the limits of the chassis. It's an old design, you can feel it. But with this suspension upgrade, this is way, way better than I thought this car could be. addictive I love that when you bang it into the next gear it just sort of like surges forward oh I'm really enjoying this now look it may not be an amazing chassis but driven in a certain way that engine when you wake it up is I take it all back now it looks a bit weird in the engine bay I have to tell you when he opened up that exquisite bonnet with those lovely catches you just sort of see us a bit of plastic, some injectors, not injectors, a bit of wiring, and it's odd, it's very odd. This particular car, the one bit there, I think, of that Ford engine, which is made by Morgan, is the airbox. And unfortunately for David, that is the one bit that failed. I think the seam going around the edge, um, the glue failed or the seam failed, and so it took him quite a long time to find out what was going on because it was letting air through, it wasn't running properly. And that is a shame, and his feedback really is he loves these cars. I think he, these cars, I think he's had four of them. But what let them down is some of the detailing, so it's some bits like that really, things like the spotlights, because at least on this year of car, they weren't mounted on a rubber donut, so they they kind of shake themselves to death and he's had to replace those. The engine has been faultless and the more I'm driving it, the more I'm sort of thinking, actually, you know what? You know, he's telling me he thinks this is the best version of this car with this engine and I just want to open it up a tiny bit. So even when it's idling and when you start it up and when you're bumbling around, it has a bit more noise, even off the throttle at the moment. You just have to use a bit of throttle to wake it up and make it feel the way it should. Well, everybody, I've fallen a little bit in love with this British masterpiece. I'm telling you that I absolutely did not think I would. I thought I'd come from, away from it thinking it looks lovely. It's an old experience, but not for me. Instead, the more I'm driving it around and the more, in a weird way, the floors are kind of gelling together into one, and I'm really loving it. I'm really loving it. I mean, they look beautiful and that of course does help. Um, but this modern power plant and the fact that David has obviously improved the suspension does make this a lovely, lovely car. Incidentally, I think that David is thinking of selling this. So if you're interested, I'll put the, I'll put his email address in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching. I hugely appreciate it. Please do subscribe if you haven't. If you'd like me to do a review on one of your cars, then please contact me either Instagram or by email. Lastly, if you want to see an example of a real British brute, a flawed British brute, then please have a look at my Daimler Dart video. Thank you so much and see you for the next one.